Can you really use an Aston Martin as a dad car? Can you fit child seats in the back? But what are the running costs? Are they crippling? Are they any good to drive? And after a year of ownership, am I running for the hills? I'll answer all of this and more. My name's Ben and welcome to Dad Cars. <laughs> So if you watch any other video content about Aston Martins, they'll tell you that the rear seats are useless. So let's test that right now. I am five foot 11. I weigh about 14 stone. Well, let's be honest, 14 and a half. I just had another baby. Let's see just how tight it is in the back. Right, so I'm sat here, my head's on, on tilt because it's pushing up against. Okay. This, the seat won't go back, my knees are in the way, but hang on. Let's move the seat all the way forward. There we go. And I could strap myself in here. So, I've just busted the myth that the rear seats in an Aston Martin are useless because you've got a 511 bloke sat in the back. Okay, so I wouldn't want to go on a long journey, but Certainly 15 minutes somewhere, I could sit back here. Now, I don't think you'd want to drive the car with the seat all the way forward. So, um, so maybe it's not quite as practical on this side. But this is a bit of a game changer, right? If I can fit here, let's see what else can fit back here. So what about rear facing baby seats? So I was going to try this with my baby in the seat, but you'll see why I thought better of that idea. Even getting the seat in is not easy. I'll fast forward this bit. So with the passenger seat leaning right forward and basically being now unusable, it's technically in there, but it gets a thumbs down for me. I don't think I would do this unless it was an absolute emergency. I don't like rear facing baby seats that aren't in Isofix. They just never, they just never feel secure. Um, front facing child seats, however, if they are strapped in nice and tight and you're not taking them in and out all the time, I think they can be just as good. That's my opinion, okay? Look, this is all just what I do, my opinion. You've got to figure out what, what you're happy with, okay? But let's have a look at front facing child seats. What does Aston Martin say about child seats? Aston Martin does not recommend any child seat for this vehicle, but then they go on to say, that you can consult with local manufacturers of smaller forward facing restraints and booster cushions um, and follow their instructions. Okay, right, so let's do that then. Let's have a look at what's available. If you've already got some conventional forward facing belt secured child seats like these, you can just forget it. There's no way they're gonna fit in the back of an Aston. However, what I found is that good quality travel child seats fit in the back of these really well. So over there, you've got um, the seat for my eldest, where you use the seat belt within the car to, um, to, to, to strap herself in. And that normally sits in the front seat. And then I've got two of these three-point harness ones in the back. And I spend a bit of time getting them in there nice and tight. But, um, but look, disclaimer, this isn't a recommendation. Obviously, I read the manufacturing instructions and I was happy to put these in. So I recommend that you do that yourself and make your own decision. But, um, but yeah, look, just to show you, you can fit good quality travel child seats in the back of these. So you just pull the seat back. I always perch myself here. And then while you're sat here rather comfortably, <laughs> click, done. Daddy, daddy, daddy. So there are real advantages of it being so compact in here. While you're driving along, you can safely get to your children for whatever reason. I've had it several times when one of them's been asleep in the back here and then there's been traffic lights for some reason that I need to stop. And I've put my hand across her chest while stopping safely without waking her up, which has been good, hasn't it? Yeah. Another thing, if you, yours are anything like mine and they love their cuddly toys or there's something they got in the car and they drop it on the floor. How much of a nightmare is that? So girls, can you chuck your, um, put your cuddly toys on the floor? Oh no, right. So I'm driving along and I need to pick up the cuddly toy. I could do that easily. And then even on this side as well. So look, real advantages. And girls, where does daddy keep the sweets? In here. 
which is really handy, isn't it? Yeah. There we go. Would you like one? <laughs> and it's actually even more practical for older children who don't need car seats. Just look at my nephews here getting in the back. Okay, guys, so yeah, show us how easy it is to get in. Nice. And then leg room. Lots of leg room. That is not bad actually, is it? No. Yeah, so let's see your leg space there. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yep, go. Oh! Oh my god! Oh my god! So the DB9 was announced in 2003 with those early cars coming in 2004, 2005. Now, while people loved the DB9, there was criticisms of the handling. So in 2006, Aston Martin released the Sports Pack, which was a two and a half thousand pound option at new. And that transformed the handling and feel of the car. So you got lighter weight alloys, which were one kilogram lighter per corner. The ride height was lowered by six millimetres. The steering rack was uh, made quicker. You got massively upgraded springs and improved dampers and additional bracing. And you got a aluminium under tray, which was structural at the bottom of the car, which shows up on your MOT advisories because they can't get to see what's underneath the car. And this addressed all of those concerns. And then everybody loved the DB9 going forward. So the next big upgrade came in 2009 and it took a handful of lovely upgrades from what was then exclusive to the DBS. So you've got this new upgraded waterfall dash, you've got the all important glass top emotional control unit glass key. Um, externally, you could tell that the front grille was slightly changed from 2009 onwards. You've got the DBS sleeker, much nicer wing mirrors as well. They upgraded the power of the engine by 20 brake horsepower, bringing this car up to 470 brake horsepower. The Tiptronic gearbox got a big upgrade, so gear changes were smoother and quicker. It also got Bilstein dampers and loads of stuff to do with the suspension and things, um, all to just improve the ride quality. Now, beyond this, the next big revision was the 2013 DB9.2 which had a massive upgrade on the external looks and it is absolutely stunning. Um, and then the DB9.2 GT. I mean, I've heard a lot of people say that those DB9.2s are actually a better car overall than the iconic DBS. And look, you found that so exciting that you've fallen asleep. <laughs> So enough of the history lesson. What you really want to know is how much does it cost to run a car like this? And to start off, let's look at fuel, miles per gallon. Let's see what I'm currently getting. 13.5 miles per gallon. Ugh, at least it's in the teens. But look, obviously that's not great, but I've been doing a lot of city driving with the children recently. So that's probably why it's looked so bad there. But on longer runs, I've been able to get early 20s, I would say. But if you're trying to get any more than early 20s, even on a long run, you're going to be in sixth gear in a slow lane, in which case, what's the point, right? So I've done about 4,000 miles in this car. So yeah, in the first year, about 4,000 miles. I bought it at 38,000 miles on the clock and it's currently got 42. So I estimate that that's cost me in fuel about 2,000 pounds to do those 4,000 miles. Insurance isn't too bad at all, actually. I pay around £400 for insurance. That's what you get as a 34-year-old dad, which isn't too bad. Tax, yeah, road tax is like £600, isn't it? There's nothing you can do about that. Um, tires, if you needed a full set of tires, that's going to cost you a grand or thereabouts. Services, um, I use a place in Basingstoke called Phoenix Aston Martin, who the guys up there have been really kind to me. 
and a service will cost you around 600 pounds or um, a thousand pounds if it's a big service so the first service that i did on this car last year was a big one so i had to pay the around 1000 pound for it also there was a few niggles that i wanted to get sorted with the car um, the guys picked up a few bits as well uh, i needed new discs all around and new pads all around so that bill came in at around three and a half thousand pounds so yeah not cheap but i think going forward i think if you allowed about two thousand pounds a year for servicing and maintenance you know things going wrong or things that you've got to replace i think that'd be about right so if you allow two thousand pounds for servicing and maintenance two thousand pounds for fuel and then a thousand pounds for um tax and insurance so yeah it probably costs what about five thousand pounds a year probably to run this car now bear in mind that it costs on average about seven thousand pounds a year to put a child in full-time nursery if you look at it like that it's not too bad right or is that just me using dad maths hey. boot. <laughs> the boot is bigger than people say as well right enough neggy talk about money let's get into the fun part let's take it out for a spin and for that you need this the lovely glass key the same ecu emotional control unit that you find in the iconic dbs the vanquish 2 and even the 177 so it's no exaggeration to say that it's special every time you put it in <laughs> sit in this car you know and you feel that you are in something really special everything is wrapped in high quality leather the steering wheel the paddles Alcantara headline everything in this car well almost everything in this car just screams quality and and makes you feel like you're in something truly special it's a similar feeling I would say as sitting in say a Murcielago or, or another supercar from this era um, I mean on that it's got the same handbrake location as the Murcielago and you can tell that this car is built for its sleek style as opposed to function so you sit feel like you sit quite low down in the car and these windows are tiny but then that all just adds to the occasion of driving it and how special it feels. So I was generally concerned about meeting my hero with the DB9. I built it up in my head as this huge thing over the course of 15 plus years and surely it was going to disappoint right? Because the car that I owned before this was a Lotus Elise S2, a supercharged one. So these are opposite ends of the spectrum right? So surely it's going to disappoint, it's going to feel like an old boat, I'm going to need my pipe and slippers, right? However, when I test drove this car, I was blown away with the driving feel of it. The steering feels tremendous. I feel in tune with the road, it softens out the worst of the bumps that obviously would, would shake my children to the core if I was at the lease. But I still really know and feel planted and connected to this car. Now that might have something to do with the fact that the chassis actually is pretty similar technology to that in the Lotus Elise, an aluminium chassis. But what I put it down to is the revisions of the sports pack and the further revisions of this 2009 car. And it drives amazing and feels tremendous. So after test driving this car, an early manual car came up locally with low miles within price range. That's it, right? How rare are DB9 manuals? That's it, I've got it, I'm gonna to have to go and buy that. So I went and test drove it. And that early car felt like how I was worried the DB9 would feel. I didn't feel overly connected to the car. 
it felt like it was floating and wallowing around a little bit whilst also being a bit crashy and the steering it, it just it just didn't feel right even with that tremendous manual gearbox so I went back and uh, yeah I picked up this car so this car when it was new was around about £110,000 and adjusting for inflation in today's money, well, with inflation going up like 10% in the last year, I mean look, it probably, it's probably about £160,000 in today's money. But you could pick up one of these 470 glass key DB9s for around £40,000, which I think is tremendous value for money when you consider that this is a 6 litre naturally aspirated V12 engine. So what else can you buy for £40,000 that is as special, that is as exciting, has as much character as this, and you can fit kids in the back? Let me know in the comments, there must be some other stuff, as a Mustang just drove past. The 5 litre Mustang V8s, that is definitely a dad car that I would love to drive. If you're still watching this video, please subscribe, okay? On a small channel like mine, every time I get a subscriber, it makes me super happy. So please, please, please subscribe. Right, look, should we launch it? Woo! Honestly, never gets boring. Never, ever gets boring. The sound of that engine. Oh, it's amazing. And look, I'm a manual guy, I'm a manual guy, but for this car, for a Super GT like this, this Touchtronic gearbox is fantastic. Suits it perfectly. <laughs> I mean, particularly on UK roads. It's 470 brake horsepower, not enough. I'd argue that it is, particularly if you're using it as a dad car. chance of after a year of ownership of this car I would be looking to get out of it as quick as possible and putting the whole sports car dad car thing behind me I thought it was going to cost too much I thought it was going to be unenjoyable owning it I thought it was going to be impractical for the children but it wasn't any of those things in fact it's been a complete delight <laughs> there's anybody out there who has an exciting car and they'd be happy for me to make a video like this showing that it's practical and can be used with children then please reach out to me my email address is in the description so my goal with this channel is to review as many cool cars like this as possible and start to change perception around what people think when they hear the phrase dad cars okay so a dad car can be cool, a dad car can be exciting, as long as you're not too precious about it. Um, and yeah, go for it and start making memories. So as the heavens open up, the rain's coming down, I'm losing traction in the rear wheels. Let's wrap this video up. Thank you so much for watching. Let me leave you one last thing. If you're a petrol head, you should have a car which impresses your eight-year-old self and leaves your 80 year old self with lots of memories. And with that in mind, as I'm losing tracks, thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.